All right, everyone. So welcome to our lesson on reforming politics in the Gilded Age. So we have some objectives and standards to recognize the impact of political forms during the Gilded Age and to identify the role of U.S. presidents in reform. So please take a look at the standards there as well. And our vocabulary preview, uh, patronage, giving jobs to supporters in return for helping a politician win an election, and civil service, which is a merit system used to hire people for positions in the government based on their skills and performance. Think about this. What reforms could be made to politics during the Gilded uh, Age? You've learned about some political corruption and things that went on, so what do you think some reforms could possibly be made? And our central question, what political reforms occurred during the Gilded Age? Okay, so the problem with patronage. So since the early 1800s, presidents complained about the problem of patronage. Uh, under President Andrew Jackson, it was known as the spoils system. I don't know if you ever heard the saying, to the victor go the spoils, meaning that, you know, since, you know, if you win or not, you know, then you get to decide who you want to be in your administration and your cabinet. Um, the problem with this was is some of these people, from cabinet members to those who cleaned the buildings, were not capable of doing their jobs. They were just given these positions or jobs because they had supported uh, the candidate in winning the election. They also received and kept these jobs due to their political connections, and sometimes they used these positions for personal gains as well. So reformers start to press for an end to the patronage system. They wanted a merit system of hiring that would give jobs in the civil service to people who were qualified. So civil service reform occurred under different presidents in the middle to late 1800s. So let's talk about uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, Republican Rutherford B. Hayes was elected in 1876, took office in 1877. Um, he was unable to convince Congress to act on reform in terms of political corruption, so he took action on his own. He named independence to his cabinet, and he set up a commission to investigate custom houses, which were known for their patronage. Um, and based on the report by the commission, he filed, fired two top officials of New York's custom houses uh, where the jobs were controlled by the Republican Party. So here he is, a Republican president, firing two top you know, people who are involved with the Republican Party. So this obviously doesn't go over well uh, with many people, especially in his own party, including Roscoe Conkling, who was a New York Republican senator and political boss. And this is a picture of Rutherford B. Hayes down there. So Hayes decided not to run for re-election in 1880. Um, there was political fighting at the Republican convention between the stalwarts, who were those who were um, against reforms. I should say against reforms. I'm sorry, I was reading my um, stuff there. So I should say for those who were against reforms, try and put that in here, against Sorry, my hand a little bad there. Against reform. So the stalwarts were people who were against reform. And they included people like Roscoe Conkling. There you go. And those who uh, did support reforms. There's two parties. Those who were against it, those who were for it. Neither side could uh, gain a majority vote for a candidate. So instead, they decided to support an independent Ohio congressman by the name of James A. Garfield. Now, in order to balance Garfield's ties to reforms, because Garfield leaned more towards political reform, uh, they chose Chester A. Arthur uh, as his vice president, uh, who was more so against political reform. So when Garfield was elected, he gave um, uh, patronage jobs to reformers which angered the stalwarts, so he gave a lot of those jobs to people who were like-minded reformers like himself, uh, which angered <coughs> the stalwarts. Now, as President James A. Garfield, he walked to a Washington, D.C. train station on July 2nd, 1881. This is a couple months after he was sworn in. Uh, he was shot twice by a mentally unstable lawyer named Charles Guiteau. 
um, who had been turned down for a job by Garfield. Eventually, Garfield will die from his wounds a couple months later on September 19th, 1881, so Garfield will become the second president to be assassinated, Abraham Lincoln being the first. Um, and then Chester A. Arthur will become president, and even though he was put on to be a uh, person who was going to stop the reforms, he becomes a reformer himself. So once he became president, uh, Chester A. Arthur urged Congress to pass a civil service law. The Pendleton Civil Service Act of 1883 approved a bipartisan civil service commission that would make appointments to federal jobs based on a merit system, which is based on a person's performance on an examination. More than 40% of all federal jobs were classified as civil service by 1901. Now, reform made public administration more honest and efficient, but this also caused politicians to look elsewhere for donations. So since they couldn't get the support from you know, their friends necessarily anymore, they looked elsewhere for donations. There's a picture of Chester A. Arthur down there. So where did they go to look for other influence? Well, politicians turned to wealthy business owners as a source of co uh, campaign contributions. Big businesses hoped that the government would keep tariffs, which are taxes on imported goods, high or even raise them. This protects domestic companies from companies overseas, like foreign competition. Now, President Grover Cleveland attempted to lower tariffs in 1884, but Congress refused to support it. So the election of 1888, uh, this man here on the right, this is Grover Cleveland. Um, President Cleveland ran for re-election in 1888 against a former Indiana senator and grandson of President William Henry Harrison. His name was Benjamin Harrison. Harrison received large contributions from companies that wanted higher tariffs. So again, getting support from businesses. Cleveland did win the popular vote, but Harrison was elected. Um, and a, a story I like to tell is that when um, President Cleveland was leaving the White House, uh, his wife, I don't remember her first name right now, but his wife stated uh, don't something along the lines of, you know, like, don't worry, we'll be back or something like that. So we'll see where that goes. So President Harrison signed the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890, which raised tariffs to their highest level to that point. Grover Cleveland returned to challenge President Harrison in 1892 and was elected again. So Grover Cleveland is the only president to this point to have been president, uh, been defeated as a president, and then come back four years later, run again, and be elected again. So he was president twice. Um, Grover Cleveland then did support a bill that would lower the McKinley tariff, but did not sign it because it allowed for a federal income tax. But in 1894, the Wilson-Gorman tariff became law. Tariff, I'm sorry, became law. In 1897, William McKinley, we'll talk more about him later on, became president and will raise tariffs again. All right, so reforming politics in the Gilded Age. Uh, civil service, like the merit system, helped reform politics and getting rid of the patronage system a little bit. And then, of course, you saw how many different U.S. presidents uh, tried to or did succeed in helping to reform the government um, in different ways. All right, well, that's all I have for this lesson, so just make sure you uh, try your best on the questions, and I'll see and talk to you soon.